West Wing on the driveway there as you see photographers getting ready for this announcement. South Korea's president says there are many critical moments ahead in this effort to end the nuclear standoff with his rivals to the north. We're being told that this announcement will include an invite to meet President Trump to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. There continue to be signs of optimism from the even most usually skeptical quarters on this issue. Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent Greg Palcott has the latest from London tonight. As efforts to tamp down the North Korean nuclear crisis pick up steam, the Trump administration remains cautious. Secretary of State Tillerson traveling in Africa. We're a long ways from negotiations. I think it's, we just need to be very clear-eyed and realistic about it. I think the first step, and I've said this before, is, is to have talks, have some kind of talks about talks. Top South Korean officials bringing a message from Kim Jong-un to President Trump. The country's security and intelligence heads at the White House debriefing National Security Chief McMaster and others about their meeting in Pyongyang. The North Korean leader said to be open to talks with the U.S. and even raising the possibility of getting rid of his nukes if his regime is not threatened, even offering to pause launches and tests. Analysts say more will be needed. They want to hear that the North Koreans are dead serious about this and they're not lying through their teeth like they've had in the past. Vice President Pence took a hard line on North Korea last month with South Korean President Moon. Moon saying today many critical moments are ahead before North Korea gives up its nukes. One of those, a summit between Moon and Kim Jong-un planned for the end of next month of the DMZ. Neighbor and North Korean ally China is hoping for the best. We call on the parties, particularly the U.S. and North Korea, to engage in dialogue sooner rather than later with the progress towards denuclearization. And Brett, as you have mentioned, we are waiting this major announcement coming from the White House in less than 25 minutes now. It will be coming from the National Security Advisor for South Korea, accompanied by the White House press spokesperson Sarah Huckabee Sanders. This comes after this long debrief that uh, the South Korean officials had with uh, National Security Advisor uh, McMaster, as well as other U.S. officials. comes after that meeting with Kim Jong-un and Pyongyang earlier this week by the South Koreans, at which time Kim Jong-un reportedly said that he was willing to talk to the U.S. He was even willing to talk about denuclearization if there were assurances that his regime would be in a secure place. We have heard from our correspondent uh, in Washington, uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Griffin, that in fact a U.S. official is saying that the core of this announcement will be an invitation from Kim Jong-un to President Trump himself to meet. Uh, also to be mentioned a uh, confirmation that there will be a meeting with a summit with the South Korean President Moon as well as Kim Jong-un. And I think something important here, uh, Brett, uh, the hardening up of another offer being put out there uh, reportedly by Kim Jong-un that there would be a stop, a freeze in the missile launches, the nuclear testing. I, I think just an invitation to President Trump wouldn't have been enough. It looks like we should get something more, and that's what we could be getting. One final note, I got an email from a close contact with the South Korean president just about an hour ago intimating that something big was happening. We could be seeing that, Brett. Yeah, and just quickly, Greg, the caveat here was that the U.S. was not going to move forward unless they saw some significant movement. So we'll wait and see what, what happens in 25 minutes here, but that pop possibly that is happening. If it happened, the meeting would be in the Peace House, where you and I have both been, right there between North Korea and South Korea along the DMZ. Is that correct? Certainly the Peace House will be the venue for the, for the summit between uh, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and uh, South Korean President Moon. We don't have a secure fix on where President Trump might be meeting uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un, but I would imagine it would be some kind of a neutral location, which that is, as you note, right along the DMZ. We will find out in just a few minutes. Greg Palcott, live in London. Greg, thank you very much. Up next, the President 
pulls the trigger on tariffs, and we await this statement from the South Koreans uh, just outside the West Wing there on the driveway. The stand-up position will bring that to you live. The panel will join us to digest all of this breaking news. First, though, beyond our borders tonight, there are new accusations that Syria is using chemical weapons against its citizens again. Doctors and residents in rebel-controlled suburban Damascus say they can smell the chlorine odor, and patients are having trouble breathing there. Syrian government forces backed by Russia continue to pound that area. They deny using the weapons. Turkey and Iraq may conduct joint military operations against Kurdish rebels. That's the word from Turkey's foreign minister after a meeting with his Austrian counterpart in Vienna. Turkey frequently launches cross-border operations into northern Iraq in pursuit of Kurdish militants that it considers terrorists. And women across Europe and Asia shouted their demands for equality, respect, and empowerment on this International Women's Day. Protesters in Madrid gathered at the city's central square to demand change. In New Delhi, hundreds marched through the capital to highlight domestic violence, sexual attacks, and job discrimination. And in Israel, activists were next to Jerusalem's Damascus Gate to call for implementation of a U.S. resolution calling for greater involvement by women in the peace process. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. Breaking news tonight. We'll be right back. We want to build our ships. We want to build our planes. We want to build our military equipment with steel, with aluminum from our country. You don't want to pay tax? Bring your plan to the USA. There's no tax. We're negotiating now with China. We're in the midst of a big negotiation. I don't know that anything's going to come of it. They have been very helpful. President Xi, I have great respect for, a lot of respect. But I don't know that anything's going to come of that. But uh, we're going to cut down the, the deficits one way or the other. President Trump today uh, pulling the trigger on what he's talked about for a long time, and that is tariffs on imported steel and aluminum. Despite some pushback from people in his own party about this, uh, that said, there could be a lot of wiggle room when push comes to shove on what exactly happens with allies, key allies, who export steel into the U.S. We're going to start there as we await for the breaking news out of the White House on South Korea and North Korea. Let's bring in our panel. Jonathan Swan, national political reporter for Axios. Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com, and Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Okay, Katie, um, you know, it wasn't a surprise. It maybe was a surprise how it was rolled out, but the president has talked about wanting to do this for quite some time. Right. And the question is whether it's going to be as big as they say it is. Well, big as they say it is in terms of the consequences, which Republicans in the Chamber of Commerce are warning about, or whether the president is going to uh, water down some of the things that he put on the table initially. And if you look at the way that he's negotiated, he, he tends to do that. But the language that he used today in his initial opening line at the White House during his event with the steel workers behind him, when he talked about this being about flexibility and cooperation with our true friends, both in terms of national security, trade, and on a military military basis, that says to me that he is not just going to negotiate these tariffs on a, a trade issue. He's going to negotiate this from the perspective of, are our NATO allies still going to contribute more money, as he's talked about in the past? But for Republicans uh, who have criticized this, it's not just that they, on principle, oppose these tariffs, which they do, based on the history of how tariffs have affected the economy in this country. They're also doing this uh, politically because if the tariffs do take away all of the gains from tax reform that Republicans have been able to go back to their districts in an election year and tout, they can say that they were against it from the beginning and it's not necessarily their fault because they had that distance from the president on the issue. But Jonathan, think about this. I mean, if it is, as it's starting to unfold here, that each ally, each country involved is going to individually negotiate on some, in some way to avoid these tariffs on their exports. Uh, you could foresee that some of those countries are going to take that ball and run with it, and maybe it doesn't affect those big countries who are exporting steel into the U.S. Well, yes, that's the most, from their perspective, the most optimistic um, scenario. But just to get you inside Trump's thinking here, he one of the big breakthroughs in his own mind 
because he didn't want to do any exceptions. All along, for 30 months, he was saying, you know, if I give Canada an exception, then I get a call from Japan, and then I have to give them. So he didn't want to do anything. He wanted to do blanket global tariffs. But he had a conversation with Justin Trudeau, the Canadian leader, and he became convinced that he could get a better deal on NAFTA because Canada sells so much steel and so much aluminum to the U.S. Well, Mexico much less, actually. It's really about Canada much more than Mexico, even though they are exempt. Canada is the big one who sells steel and, and aluminum. And so Trump believes he's going to get a better deal on NAFTA. What if he doesn't? He could easily go flip back in the other direction. So I know we're all saying he's going to go in this like nice, kind, gentle direction, but I think we have to consider the other possibility as well. In return. That's my Only point. if he gets something yeah, in return. That's Absolutely. exactly my point. Politically, right. the image of the president with those steel workers telling their stories about companies that are slowing down, shutting down, losing work, that politically works for this president. Certainly in western Pennsylvania where they're about to have a special election. Pennsylvania uh, 18 next this week. coming Tuesday and there's a lot of uh, steel mills and uh, of course um, economically this is kind of an unsquarable circle. You, this thing can either have its effect and save those steel jobs you're talking about or it can be acceptable to our allies. It can't be, it can't really be both. And so what I think the president has set up here is this funny kind of lobby orama in Washington where everybody and their paid hired guns here in Washington are going to suddenly bombard the bureaucracy, Bob Lighthizer in particular, with their plea for some kind of a carve out in this thing. And then you, if, if any of them get it, uh, the question will be, well, does, is there anything left of the protection that he's talking about that's so important? So it's actually, when you really think about it, it's he uh, has in mind, and the criteria, Brett, that he was offering these countries were very vaguely stated. Well, if they do a little more on military, if they treat us fairly. So um, if there are going to be any carve-outs, if this thing is going to be uh, turned into Swiss cheese, as John Roberts said the Bush tariffs were, uh, it will be after a long, drawn-out process uh, that has a lot of politics involved in it. All right, here is uh, the president essentially saying goodbye to his advisor, Gary Cohn, today. He's going to go out and make another couple of hundred million, and then, <laughs> then he's going to maybe come back. He might come back, right? We'll be here Absolutely. another seven years, hopefully, and that's a long time. But I have a feeling you'll be back. I don't know if I can put him in the same position, though. It's, it's, he's not quite as strong on those tariffs as we want, but that's all. <laughs> Went on to call him a globalist uh, a couple times as well. It was a nice, lighthearted moment. I'm glad to see that Gary Cohn is leaving the White House on good terms. He's certainly not getting the Steve Bannon treatment. Uh, and the intrigue about what he will do if he comes back is, is interesting. As the New York Times reported, maybe he's going to be the next chief of staff. Inside skinny on who's up for that position? You, you mean the chief of staff position? No, or no, 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 NEC. NEC. Um, Shahira Knight is a name that is being thrown around a lot. She's a senior official on the National Economic Council. Gary Cohn is advocating for her, but so are senior people on Capitol Hill. She's definitely in the mix, uh, but there's others as well. We've reported Kevin Walsh, who is in the running for Fed chair, is a name that Trump's talking about, but he's still spitballing. Larry Kudlow? He, I haven't heard his name as much. It, it's been in the media ether, but I haven't actually heard from, you know, people inside that he's really up the top of that. All right, well, we're going to hear, hear from people inside pretty soon. We are told by our own Jennifer Griffin that this will include some uh, description of the meeting between uh, the South Koreans and the North Koreans uh, and an invitation to President Trump to meet directly with Kim Jong-un. It also will contain a promise by the North Koreans not to test anymore and a suggestion that denuclearization is a possibility. That meeting, if it happened, would happen at Peace House in the DMZ. You may remember back in November, we took you there to the DMZ. That is the space in between North and South Korea, the house, these blue houses, the place where negotiations would happen if they happened. They're standing in North Korea showing you the table uh, where that would go down. We assume that that's where the president would go if a meeting took place right there in between the two countries in a neutral area. We are back with the panel. Uh, Jonathan, big news, and we'll wait to hear this statement at the top of the hour, but uh, if it all comes as the president suggests, uh, that's a big moment. Well, the, the meeting would be the big moment, um, but if the parameters of the discussion are what we just heard, we do need to put it in context, which is that this is like Groundhog Day times a thousand. The North Koreans always say this, and they never mean it. 
they will never the, the idea that you know there's a possibility of denuclearization their whole premise is that we are a nuclear power you need to accept us as a nuclear power and so there might be some wishy-washy language about that but again I'd be surprised if the hard commitment goes beyond we'll stop testing Right. And we have seen this. It is like Lucy and the football with the North Koreans promising to do all kinds of things. However, are they here because of the actions and statements of this president up until there, you know, so that the South Koreans moved, the North Koreans moved, the Chinese moved mm -hmm. more than they had been moving? Right. Is that why we're at this moment? Well, going back to just October, the president was telling Secretary of State Rex Tillerson not to waste his time negotiating with Little Rocket Man. And now here we are with reportedly uh, the North Koreans extending an invitation, Kim Jong-un himself, to the President of the United States to have direct talks. And the direct talks here is really the news, because if you talk to, uh, I was in China in November on the heels of President Trump's trip, I met with a number of government officials, Chinese officials, and think tank experts there, nuclear experts, and their whole premise was, the United States and North Korea have to talk about this directly. You can't keep putting us in the middle of these talks, you're the ones who have to do this. And as you've seen publicly, we haven't seen China involved really in the negotiations over the past couple of months. There's obviously a healthy dose, dose of skepticism, as Jonathan mentions, uh, but talking is a lot different than the threats of action, which we heard for several weeks, you know, a couple of months ago. Absolutely, and I think there is a case to be made that these sanctions, the uh, extreme sanctions, as they've been called, are starting to take a toll. But I also think that for both the South and the North, um, they are looking at a, a whole world geopolitically that's changing very rapidly. You know, in some ways it's now, in 1992 or so, we had the end of the Cold War. Now we're kind of having the end of the end of the Cold War. And in both Beijing and Washington, you have very different kinds of leadership than what they've been accustomed to in the past. And possibly what this attempt to sort of see what can be worked out on a kind of intra-Korean basis, obviously with the U.S. and Beijing dialed in, is their way of reacting and reaccommodating to that because they have um, new actors in charge espousing new kinds of politics responding to all kinds of new forces and these korean governments are going to try and adapt and survive that jonathan on the backdrop is the trade talk and korea mm -hmm. uh, japan china obviously the focus of all of this as this national security threat and the diplomacy uh, moves forward. Yeah, and Trump has, uh, in a way that we've never seen before, a U.S. president explicitly linked trade and national security. I mean, he literally said to China, if you... surprised if he has. All right, final uh, from South Korea officials actually about North Korea. Sources telling Fox the South Korean National Security Advisor will talk about an upcoming meeting between South Korea's president and the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un and also the possibility of invite uh, for a meeting between President Trump and Kim. Now you look at what the North Koreans have done over the past few years, missile tests and missiles launched. Uh, take a look at that, 2017 missiles launched, 24 16 tests, conducted three intercontinental ballistic missile tests in 2017. We're told that they will stop testing and that they're talking about denuclearization. Whether that's real or not, we shall see. You can see this statement right here live on Fox. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. Continuing coverage on The Story with guest host Sandra Smith starting right now. Sandra. Brett, great to see you and great to have you back. We pick up the story from here. Fox News alert, we are waiting. What President Trump says will be a major announcement from South Korea. South Korea's national security advisor is expected to come to that podium at any moment. Let's bring in Chief White House correspondent John Roberts with what to expect here. An unexpected evening and announcement, John.
Well, you know, it's just typical here at the White House, Sandra. I've got to put it that way. Every day when you're just feeling like you could back up and go home, some other piece of breaking news happens. We're, we're outside the, the West Wing portico here. It's a, it's a location that you're familiar with when people come out and talk. It's an unfamiliar location for us to broadcast from. And we're expecting that in the next few minutes, Chung Young, who is the South Korean national security advisor, will be coming out here to brief us on a couple of things. First of all, uh, he'll give us a, a sort of a rundown of what happened in the meetings that South Korean officials had with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, earlier this week. And then he will talk about an invitation that Kim Jong-un is issuing to President Trump to meet. Now, if this were to happen, this would be an extraordinary breakthrough because U.S. presidents uh, have been talking with North Korea, cutting deals with North Korea for tonight, and we may, uh, whether or not any preparations are being made for a meeting between uh, the two presidents. Certainly, President Trump has said he'd be happy to meet with Kim Jong-un if the conditions were right for that, and the conditions would be that the substance of the conversation and roll it back or they would have to get rid of it altogether. Then there's the question of where would the two leaders meet? Kim Jong-un will be coming to South Korea along the border uh, at Panmunjom. There's a place called the Peace House on the South Korean side of that. border. That's where he'll be meeting in late May with Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president. But if President Trump were to meet with Kim, where would it happen? It certainly wouldn't happen on North Korean soil. It might be able to happen on South Korean soil if they played sort of a neutral broker in all of this, or it could be some third location. We don't know any of this because we do not know if the president has will accept his invitation. But we're told that tonight's announcement is going to be very, very big, Sandra. So keep it here. We'll have it for you very shortly. So to remind everybody, how said about his willingness to potentially meet with the North Korean leader? Well, he, he, he has said on several occasions that he would be willing to meet. toward North Korea, saber rattling, saying my nuclear button's bigger than yours. Uh, when we had Jim Mattis, the uh, defense secretary, come out and said, we're not looking for the complete annihilation of a country, namely North Korea. I mean, there's been a lot of extraordinarily tough talk. from this president, from this administration toward North Korea. But I'll let you know something. When, when I was sitting outside the presidential palace in Hanoi, Vietnam, waiting for President Trump to arrive, my phone rang. And it was the president that was on the phone. And the, we, started, we talked about a number of things, and talk came around to North Korea. And he said, John, there's a lot of people thinking that I want to start a war. They're accusing me of wanting to start a war with North Korea. He says, I'm trying to avoid a war. So if all that tough talk and the sanctions has brought to work. And then we saw that slight opening where North Korea joined in with South Korea in the in the Olympic Games and they marched together in the opening ceremonies. And now we're moving to the next diplomatic step along the line, which is talks between North Korea and South Korea, talks between the two leaders of North and South Korea, and then maybe a history making event. Uh, the very first meeting of, of a U.S. president and a North Korean leader since the Korean War. I mean, that would be extraordinary. And this announcement, John, is coming after hours of meetings today happening in that White House. Just a, a reminder to everybody tuning in right now, we're expecting uh, the South Korean National Security Advisor to walk out to those microphones, as you just detailed, John, outside of the West Wing. Portico to make a major announcement and the Pentagon, according to our reporting, has said that this is going to include an invitation from Kim Jong-un to meet with President Trump. Do we know anything else uh, more, John, about who 
will accompany him to that microphone to make this announcement. Um, I, you know, he's got a staff, clearly, and on the same way that H.R. McMaster, who's the national security advisor here at the White House, has a staff. But it will be Chung Yong, uh, who's the national security Here, but we're being led to believe uh, by the significance of this announcement, as you know, uh, previewed to us by the White House, that this could be something very, very it's on the House Committee on Homeland Security. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Walt, a former counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Cheney and a Fox News contributor. And Tom Rogan, Washington Examiner commentary writer. Uh, I want to start with you first, uh, Colonel Walt. If you could weigh in on the president's strategy here to, to walk into that press briefing room tonight and say a major announcement is coming. Uh, it will be delivered by South Korea about North North Korea. We're right. all watching, Colonel. Well, you know, I think what this president fully understands uh, is that in order for diplomacy to work, North Korea and importantly, China had to believe that there was a credible use of military force. They had to believe that this president would exercise the military option before he allowed North Korea to have a fully capable nuclear arsenal capable of striking the United States and its allies. 